The first three decades of the 20th century in America, roughly 1900 to 1930, have been characterized as the progressive era. It was the time of growing women's social and political power culminating in the passage of the 19th Amendment and women's suffrage in 1920. And in addition, there was a new concern for protecting the land and its many wild species. And there were various movements designed to deal with the problems of heavy immigration, rapid urbanization after the Civil War, income inequality, and the consequent spreading of slums and poverty. It was also a time when the dominant economic powers of the Gilded Age, the rail and oil magnates, were being confronted by the government and their power partially broken up. Teddy Roosevelt was touting a square deal for Americans who through the Gilded Age had been oppressed by corporate elites. Child labor laws were being passed. The rights of working people were being asserted in union drives. The period of the early 20th century was the foundation for most of all the modernizing progressive movements that followed later in the century. One could think that the progressive era found expression in the black community as well. In Baltimore in 1885, the Reverend Harvey Johnson pulled together ministers and lawyers in the United Brotherhood of Liberty to defend and expand black rights. The Niagara Movement, founded in 1905, nationalized this effort. And the founding of the NAACP in 1909 brought together resources whose strategies and achievements have lasted into our own day. But black people in the progressive era were not part of the white progressive movement. In fact, they were actually targets of it. Instead of progressivism, the Supreme Court in 1896 ruled in Plessy versus Ferguson that separate but equal was the law of the land, consigning blacks to permanent second-class status under Jim Crow laws. Lynching soared during this period, as did the erection of Confederate monuments broadcasting the message that this was a white man's land. And there was so much white mob violence against blacks in 1919 that the period between April and November became known as the Red Summer. During the Progressive Era, a new pseudoscience took hold of the European world on both sides of the Atlantic, a science called eugenics. Its philosophy and its practice led to the extermination of Jews under German Nazism. And in the US, it led to intensified racism in the form of novel ways of segregation intensified lynchings, forced sterilization, white mob violence against blacks, and efforts that mirrored the sentiments of the fascist Germans against non-whites. This video will trace the contradictions between the good things of the progressive error and the horrors of progressive error scientific racism. And our starting point will be the Great Baltimore Fire of 1904, which can even be seen as a kind of metaphor for where we are today. Early on a wintry Sunday morning in Baltimore City on February the 7th, 1904, someone seems to have tossed a cigarette into a pile of sawdust in a dry goods store in the basement of the Hearst Building. The John E. Hearst Building, pictured here, was at the intersection of German Street, now known as Redwood, and Hopkins Place. Modern Baltimoreans will know the location as the site of what was first called the Civic Center and now is known as the First Mariner Arena. When the cigarette hit the sawdust in the basement of the Hearst Building, it slowly burst into flames. By 11 a.m., a building heat sensor and a fire alarm alerted the Baltimore City Fire Department. They arrived on the scene and opened a door, suddenly creating a roaring updraft. Within minutes, a great explosion on the fourth floor of the building knocked down people on the ground outside and sent flames shooting into other buildings. The Great Baltimore Fire of 1904 had begun. Before it was over, 30 hours later, 70 city blocks covering 140 acres would be burned out, extending all the way down to the harbor and all the way east to the Jones Falls. <laughs> 
although the beautiful nearly new city hall was miraculously spared as well as several other structures about 1500 buildings would be reduced to rubble and 2500 businesses destroyed The glow from the fire could be seen over 50 miles away, which of course includes Washington, D.C. Firehouses in that city to the south responded to calls for help, as well as Philadelphia to the north. Even New York City sent fire equipment on trains to assist. By Monday afternoon, the fire stopped spreading, but Baltimore gave every appearance of being ruined. The city was a smoking heap. It was hard to imagine what kind of future Baltimore might have. But another miracle happened. The Great Fire occurred in the middle of what would be known as the Progressive Era, a progressivism that had a huge modernizing impact on the reconstruction of Baltimore. Even science could now be applied to solve some of Baltimore's persistent social problems. For instance, prior to the Great Fire of 1904, Baltimore had a serious health problem. It had no public sewage system. What we now call the Inner Harbor was for most of our history called the Basin. And for a great part of two centuries, Baltimore's sewage and the offal from slaughterhouses and the chemicals from tanneries and factories had all simply flowed down the Jones Falls, the city streets, and other tributaries into the basin. As can be imagined, this open sewage led to pestilence and disease, and it stank. H. L. Mencken once described the basin as smelling like a thousand polecats. Political infighting had for years blocked Baltimore's efforts to build a proper sewage system so by the time of the Great Fire, Baltimore had almost 100,000 privy vaults or septic pits, one behind almost every house. Of course, they needed to be regularly cleaned out. And as it says under this picture, you cannot photograph the smell. Prior to the fire, many of the largest privy vaults were in downtown Baltimore to accommodate the office buildings and many businesses in the central area that was burned. These pits took up otherwise valuable heart of the city acreage. By removing privy vaults and installing a new sewer system, land could be made available for additional office buildings and new tax revenue. So before reconstruction of the burn district, with so much land virtually cleared by the fire, Baltimore immediately took the opportunity to start anew, to be a clean, modern, efficient, and healthier city. And it was one of the last big cities in the U.S. to build a sewer system. Because we were among the last cities to do so, we could learn scientifically from the mistakes and experiences of others, and our new sewer system was thoroughly up to date when it was completed in 1911. Baltimore was extremely proud of this progressive upgrade in its public infrastructure. Not only would the basin be cleaner and smell better, the land that had been devoted to sewage pits could now be converted to new office towers and businesses, all of which would significantly increase the city's tax revenue. After the fire, Baltimore's young mayor, Robert McLean, was offered monetary help from other cities to assist in rebuilding Baltimore. These offers of assistance were generous but refused because the city fathers, and they were all fathers at that time, were confident that with a combination of local benefactors and expanded opportunities to generate new tax revenue, Baltimore could rebuild on its own. And it did. Baltimore recovered from the fire so quickly that in 1906, just two years later, a jubilee was held downtown to celebrate the city's rebirth. A second modernizing consequence of the fire was that fire equipment became standardized across the country. 
Some of the fire companies, bravely and generously arriving from other cities to help, found that their hoses could not connect to our hydrants, and so their equipment was useless. Scientific standardization became the norm after the Baltimore fire. There were design improvements in the downtown area that are still with us today. The two streets nearest the harbor and along which the fire had traveled near the water, Pratt and Lombard, instead of being rebuilt as they had been, were widened to act as fire breaks. And there is one unique story coming out of the fire whose ultimate consequences did not begin to appear until the 1950s. The city merchant, Thomas O'Neill, owned a highly popular department store at the intersection of Charles and Lexington. There are people alive today, and I am one of them, whose parents took them to O'Neill's as children, often to buy clothes for their first communion, clothes for which the store was famous. During the fire, dynamiters from the fire department had wanted to blow up O'Neill's store to create a fire break. O'Neill refused the dynamiter's request and told them to leave. But O'Neill was a devout Catholic and instead asked a group of nuns to pray to God to save his building. And then, following the principle of pray to God but row toward shore, O'Neill ordered his employees up on the roof to plug up the storm drains and then release all the water in the department store's rooftop water tower. This created a rooftop pool that extinguished the dangerous embers falling from the sky. The strategy worked brilliantly and saved the building. O'Neill felt that his prayers had been answered and that God had saved his business. He later expressed his gratitude by leaving the Archdiocese of Baltimore enough money to build the Cathedral of Mary Our Queen on Charles Street in 1959 and Good Samaritan Hospital on Lock Raven Boulevard in 1968, decades after the Great Fire. So there were many good things that swept Baltimore along into a progressive future in the decades after the devastating fire of 1904. The Great Fire of 1904 that burned out 70 blocks of downtown Baltimore unleashed a wave of progressive improvements initiated by Mayor McLean and expanded by subsequent administrations. Government reform, a stronger tax base, wider streets, taller buildings, a new sewer system, a strengthened city, and the removal of African Americans. Apparently, the city fathers thought that improving Baltimore included slum clearance or moving African Americans out of the center of the city, attempts to disenfranchise blacks, and promoting legal residential racial segregation. Most emblematic of this openly racist side of progressive thinking was the removal of a neighborhood known as Gallows Hill in downtown Baltimore. The area along St. Paul Street, where it divides into an upper and lower section in front of what is now Mercy Hospital, is now a beautiful park called Preston Gardens. It has small lawns and attractive curvilinear marble staircases. But it was once called Gallows Hill, a neighborhood just north of City Hall that had many of the same kind of graceful brick homes that were found in other neighborhoods close to Mount Vernon, the home of Baltimore's Washington Monument. But in the eyes of progressive racists like then Mayor James H. Preston, it had one problem. It was a black neighborhood. Never mind that Gallows Hill residents included doctors and lawyers and people with advanced degrees, or that there were numerous black businesses here and at least three large churches, Bethel AME, Union Baptist, and St. Francis Xavier Roman Catholic Church. It was an embarrassment to the white city establishment to have a black community so close to City Hall. And it was a threat to the white Mount Vernon neighborhood to have blacks living so close that they might encroach on this bastion of white culture. Using the progressive momentum that followed the Great Fire, between 1914 and 1919, Mayor Preston had Gallows Hill demolished and sent its residents and its churches toward West Baltimore and Pennsylvania Avenue, destroying in its wake not only many homes, but many black businesses, religious institutions, and cultural and neighborhood ties. In its place, Preston built a lovely park, which he named after himself, 
and in which his statue still stands today. And as we have already suggested, the destruction of Gallows Hill was not some fluke. It happened in a national context, one of the decades-long low points in racial relations in the U.S. between 1880 and 1930, even in Maryland. At the beginning of this period, in 1885, a 15-year-old child, Howard Cooper, was dragged from his cell and lynched by a mob of about 70 white men in front of the Towson Town Jail. The next morning, before Howard's mother could retrieve her son's body, a Ma and Pa railroad train passing through Towson slowed down so the passengers could get a good view of the body hanging from a sycamore tree. After President Roosevelt invited Booker T. Washington to dine with the first family in the White House on October 16, 1901, Senator Benjamin Tillman of South Carolina said, We shall have to kill a thousand N-words to get them back in their places, just three years before the Baltimore fire. Another chief executive, President Woodrow Wilson, known as an idealist and a leader of the progressive movement, was also a Southerner. On March 21, 1915, he, his staff, and his family, together with a whole Supreme Court, watched the first movie ever shown in the White House, D.W. Griffith's The Birth of a Nation, originally called The Klansman. In the movie, freedmen, or recently freed blacks, are depicted as ignorant, lust-crazed beasts who are overtaking and destroying the South. Only an army of white men robed as Klansmen can defend the South and innocent white womanhood. Wilson, who was a respected scholar and who got his PhD at Johns Hopkins University said, it's like writing history with lightning. In August of 1925, when the Klan was its strongest across the nation, more than 30,000 KKK members who met their enemies with violence marched down the Capitol's Pennsylvania Avenue with their faces boldly exposed. They opposed blacks, Jews, Catholics, and immigrants. Membership was strong in the South, but was strongest in the Midwest and Southwest, and members of Congress and many state officials were members as well. Appreciative crowds lined the street, and this was 21 years after the fire. Near the end of the Progressive Era, in 1933, George Armwood was the last out of 40 known people to be lynched in Maryland. After being shuttled back and forth between the Eastern Shore and Baltimore under Governor Ritchie, Armwood was brutally lynched in Salisbury. This is George Armwood the day before he was lynched. This is a news photo of Mr. Armwood's body after he was dragged from his cell by his neck by a mob of 1,000, hanged in a field, and his body dragged through the streets of Salisbury, hung from a telephone pole and burned, and then dumped into a lumber yard until the authorities gathered up his body. Starting in 1920, the NAACP would hang a banner from its New York City office at 69 Fifth Avenue the day after a lynching occurred. They stopped in 1938 under threat of losing their lease. In November of 1898 in Wilmington, North Carolina, a group of white supremacists known as Red Shirts were no longer willing to tolerate a successful integrated government in Wilmington. They called a meeting to decide how they were going to defend white supremacy. In what can only be described as a coup, the white supremacists staged an insurrection, burned down a press owned by a black man, killed unknown numbers of blacks, and drove others out of town. A member of the coup of the white mob assumed the position of mayor, dispossessing blacks of their lives and property. Wilmington was at that time a symbol of what could have been America's future, blacks and whites working together in a democratic, civilized manner consistent with American ideals for a better future for all. But white supremacists not only took control of the town, they also took control of the narrative, so this experiment in a more racially just society was buried from public knowledge. In 
until recently. This happened just six years before Baltimore's Great Fire. Black soldiers returning from World War I and expecting to be respected for their service and sacrifice thought that blacks could make some progress after the war. They were now usually considered uppity for refusing future subservience and demanding rights. For eight months of 1919, from April to November, there were bloody riots across the country as black veterans used their guns to defend themselves and their families from the whites who attacked them. One riot occurred in Washington, D.C. when white veterans attacked blacks in the shadow of the White House. The blacks defended themselves and their family with guns. Seventy-eight people were lynched, eleven burned at the stake, and 237 sharecroppers were killed in Arkansas in two days for trying to form a union. Lynching was not just a bunch of good old boys going too far and losing control of themselves and doing something hateful and stupid. It was a national policy of performative terror designed to intimidate the black population into subservience to whites. The KKK functioned pretty much like ISIS does now in its context. Notice that a New Orleans newspaper has published an article announcing that a man will be burned and there is nothing that the authorities can do about it. That is because the state and county officials were in on the terrorist act. And think about the size of the crowd that was predicted to witness and cheer on this atrocity, mostly church-going people who even brought their children so that they can enjoy their first lynching. In 1921, the Tulsa, Oklahoma race riots occurred when black veterans appeared at the Tulsa jail to prevent a young man from being lynched. Their courageous defense provoked whites to invade, attack, and burn down a whole section of Tulsa called Greenwood, a prosperous black neighborhood otherwise known as Black Wall Street. 300 blacks were killed, after which many of their bodies were dumped in mass graves. The note on this photo, running the Negro out of Tulsa, was probably written by an appreciative white who was only too happy to see the homes of Tulsa's most prominent citizens going up in smoke. The history of Tulsa was buried too until quite recently. And Baltimore's fire was now only 17 years old and Gallows Hill on St. Paul Street in Baltimore, albeit with different methods, had too just been cleared of its most prominent blacks. Two years later, in 1923, the same thing happened to the black town of Rosewood, Florida, with white mobs driving black residents to flee for their lives into Florida swamps. In the midst of all this violence, redlining was invented in Baltimore in 1910, when the city council and prominent white supremacist lawyers, with the help of many churches and neighborhood organizations, over and over again devise new ways to limit black residential expansion and keep blacks bottled up in ghettos. Meanwhile, as if to rub salt in a wound, white supremacist organizations such as the United Daughters of the Confederacy triumphed in North and South alike with their false interpretation of the Civil War and the Lost Cause, claiming the big lie that the Civil War had nothing to do with slavery and erected Confederate statues across the nation. Baltimore's three most prominent statues, whose clear message was that this is a white man's land, went up in 1903 on Mount Royal Terrace with this tribute to Confederate soldiers and sailors, on University Parkway near Johns Hopkins University in 1917, and at Wyman Park across from the Baltimore Museum of Art as late as 1948. There are many factors contributing to this intensification of racism in the period between 1880 and 1930, but one of them certainly was the birth of eugenics. Growing out of this progressive movement that looked to science for answers to social and political problems came a form of scientific racism. In Germany and in the United States, it provided objective justification for some of the worst practices of the Nazis and became a kind of wind beneath the wings of some of the cruelest racial practices in the progressive age. This was the so-called science of eugenics. <laughs>
the eugenics movement was rooted in the ideas of Sir Francis Galton, who in the 1880s studied the upper classes in England and arrived at the conclusion that their superior position in the world was due to their superior genetic makeup. Eugenicists began to prove through scientific research that humans occupied a hierarchy of natural ability and genetic gifts. Early proponents of eugenics believed that through selective breeding, just as we do with animals or plants, the human species could direct its own evolution. The ideas caught on in academic communities were given scientific credence and gradually began to enter the public sphere and shape public policies. The ideas seemed intuitively compelling, even if some of the consequences seemed morally disquieting. If human society could be viewed as a hierarchy of genetic possibility, then somewhere you can divide this community into the fit and the unfit. And if people are identified as unfit, then they are at least deserving of isolation from the fit or segregation, especially to keep the unfit from mating with the fit, and sometimes sterilization to make it physically impossible for the unfit to reproduce, and dare it be said, extermination. Not surprisingly, the biggest proponents of this view tended to believe in the genetic superiority of Nordic, Germanic, and Anglo-Saxon peoples. It seemed obvious, especially to those devising public policy, and to many whites in the general public, that those who were economically poor or socially weaker were in those situations because they were genetically inferior. And in this antiseptic world of rational science, those of inferior social status were tagged as more disease or prone to disease and therefore should be kept at a distance or dealt with through sterilization or extermination. Of course, non-white immigrants and people of color made up the majority of this supposedly unfit, unwanted population. Mixing with these lesser people, whether with inferior strains of European immigrant populations, or with people of color, especially people of African descent, would only cause the Nordic race to deteriorate. These ideas were not being ginned up by some radical fringe group. The eugenics movement, part of the scientific progressive movement, was supported by the Carnegie Institution, the Rockefeller Foundation, the Harriman Railroad Fortune, and the Kellogg Company. Margaret Sanger, one of America's most prominent feminists, and the Planned Parenthood Association came out of this movement. By 1910, there was a large and dynamic network of scientists, reformists, and professionals engaged in the national eugenics projects. Across the Deep South, women's associations played an important role in gathering support for the eugenics movement, sponsoring Better Baby Contest, with Nordic standards prevailing. And it doesn't take much imagination to see how that would play into virulent racial discrimination. Even religious leaders found God's hand at work in this. Madison Grant was a leading light. He was a New York conservationist, savior of the American bison, founder of the Bronx Zoo, friend of Teddy Roosevelt, and author of a eugenics book so racist and white supremacist that Hitler wrote to Grant to say that his book was my Bible. Here is a quote from Madison Grant's book. A rigid system of selection through elimination of those who are weak or unfit, in other words, social failures, would solve the whole question in 100 years, as well as enable us to get rid of the undesirables who crowd our jails, hospitals, and insane asylums. The individual himself can be nourished, educated, and protected by the community during his lifetime. But the state, through sterilization, must see to it that his line stops with him, or else future generations will be cursed with an ever-increasing load of misguided sentimentalism. This is a practical, merciful, and inevitable solution of the whole problem, and can be applied to an ever-widening circle of social discards, beginning always with the criminal, the diseased, and the insane, and extending gradually to types which may well be called weaklings rather than defectives, and perhaps ultimately to worthless race types. <laughs>
American professors went to German universities to teach eugenics to academics there, who later would confidently conclude that extermination of their unfit in that country, so-called gypsies, communists, homosexuals, and especially the Jews, was justified. German scientists, who later became part of the Nazi movement prior to the Second World War, came to the U.S. to study the methods by which white Americans segregated and oppressed African Americans. On one such visit, these German Nazis judged the Americans to be too harsh. Mass extermination has usually been repugnant to Americans, but forced sterilization of the unfit, meaning medically removing their ability to reproduce without consent, became legal in Indiana in 1907, spread through a number of states, was vigorously enforced in California and North Carolina, and was not outlawed in the U.S. until the 1970s. Confining blacks accused of crimes to penal institutions that worked them to death, such as the infamous Angola Plantation Penitentiary in Louisiana, was not completely different in intent from the German Nazi death camp at Auschwitz emblazoned with the taunting quote, work makes you free. Even today's mass incarceration of African Americans, together with the too frequent killing of unarmed African American men and women, is experienced certainly by the African American community as a kind of slow extermination. American resistance to eugenics would mount after the horrors of World War II. But we have lost a sense after World War II of how much our society shared in these values, values that led to the Nazi Holocaust, and how much they still shape our modern racist society. The racist and classist prejudices behind the eugenics movement manifested themselves in the U.S. when the Supreme Court in 1942 prevented criminals from being sterilized if it meant sterilizing white-collar criminals as well. Sterilizing people who might be rich white men was considered a step too far. The eugenics movement was supposedly defeated by the successful battle against the German Nazis in World War II, but it left a legacy here in the U.S. which is alive and well. It is the idea that people of color, Native Americans, immigrants of all sorts, and blacks in particular are naturally inferior to whites. Even today it is an idea that haunts the minds and hearts of too many people of all races who have been shaped by our educational experiences, our social policies, and our racially segregated lives. In the end, the eugenics movement, scientific racism, gave the perfect cover for all the economic, social, and political inequities of the United States and the economic systems that caused them. If people exist on a genetic hierarchy, and the darker you are, the lower you fall on the chart, then historically or morally, those at the top, the white Europeans, bear no responsibility for any of the ills suffered by the people of color in this country or those we have touched around the world. It is just the manifestation of genetic inheritance, the workings of impartial science and its social consequences. It is the white supremacist world as it should be. Here is a gathering of American Nazis in Madison Square Garden in February of 1939. These supporters of fascism and the triumph of the master white race had to go underground after World War II began. Only recently have they been bold enough to display the Nazi swastika in public once more. In the Book of Kings and the Hebrew Scriptures, the prophet Elijah criticized the people of Israel for limping about with two opinions, with divided loyalties to a God of justice on the one hand and a God who required human sacrifice on the other. The prophet challenged the people of Israel to make a choice. The United States has been limping around with two opinions since the beginning. The men who founded this country penned some of the most sublime expressions of human dignity and political possibility that the world has ever seen or heard. That's the America many of us want to celebrate on the 4th of July. And democracy and equality before the law are the principles that many people of all colors have embraced 
as they gave their lives for our country. On the other hand, in complete violation of these noble principles, our Nordic or European ancestors came to North America and ruthlessly stole this land by nearly exterminating all of its original inhabitants. After which, the U.S.'s superpower wealth was literally built on the backs of African people it kidnapped, enslaved, and ever thereafter exploited and robbed for the benefit of white people. America's two opinions are, on the one hand, democracy and freedom that comes from the genuine rule of law, and on the other, white supremacy. The United States has had several dramatic times when our prophets have called us to stop limping around with two opinions, to choose real democracy and the rule of law over the arbitrary decisions of autocrats and the cruel lawlessness required to maintain white supremacy. The Civil War, Reconstruction, the Progressive Era, and the Civil Rights Movement of the 1950s and 60s have all been times of reckoning when we were challenged to make a choice, and we never really did. We have come out of each of these times still clinging to white supremacy and thereby crippling any real hope for a real democracy. It is happening once again. Some of the most horrifying political manifestations we have seen in recent politics are actually nothing new, despite our attempts to put a hand on our breast and claim, this is not us. Young men marching in the streets with Nazi and Confederate flags chanting, Jews will not replace us, are part of an America that has been here since the beginning, still insisting on white supremacy. The bans on critical race theory that are being imposed by school boards across the country are based on the false assumption that we can ignore our past and still cling to both things, democracy and white supremacy. But it is ever more clear that we will have to choose. Every day the news reveals that the United States will not long survive as a democracy if it ignores our prophetic voices and clings to white supremacy. Our history suggests that the wrong choice will mean a dreadful dystopian future for all of our children, black, white, and otherwise. Lake Baltimore in 1904, when a devastating fire leveled all that was familiar in the heart of the city, but gave Baltimore a chance to completely remake itself. Our whole world now seems on fire. Much that is familiar is being leveled and carted away as rubble. It is a frightening time. But we now have a real opportunity, finally and forever, to leave behind the reeking sewer pits of white supremacy and give us a stronger foundation in our efforts to meet the challenges of our day and contribute to making this a democratic and sustainable world for us and for the generations that come after us.